Right, well, welcome back. I'm glad you made it. Uh, as the last people come in, I, I just wanted to, to say that I, there was a fantastic amount of information there in that last session. I hope you got something out of it. Personally, I was really struck by the comment from uh, David's early teacher, I think he was called Harry Chasey, uh, saying that uh, if, the, if you find that your students are not learning from what you're teaching, then maybe you should think about teaching the way they learn. And it seems to me that that's at the heart of education. Everything that we do uh, is really around that. And for those of you who are parents, my goodness, I recognize that from bringing up my three daughters. Anyway, um, we're now moving on to our, our next speaker. And I'm delighted to welcome Mari Delaney who is also from the UK, originally from near Oxford, but has since moved to that beautiful Emerald Isle of Ireland. So she's now, uh, you know, she, she, she benefits from both. Why have we invited Mari? Because she's deeply involved in this field and has done quite a lot of work with us, with the British Council. Uh, only a few days ago, I read a blog of hers from Saudi Arabia, uh, where she was talking, and I know she's worked in a lot of different countries. And in particular, of course, for us, she's involved in helping us to produce that series of online materials that uh, Phil Dexter referred to earlier on. And that's certainly something we want to make available to all of you. So by now, I hope that everyone's in. So let me hand over, ask you please to welcome Mari Delaney. Sorry, I'm trying to turn on this mic. I thought you just press it here. How is it? Hello? Hello? Is that? No, it's not. Can I do this for now? Maybe you can work that out. Okay, so thanks, Tony, for that introduction. Um, and thanks for getting my name right. Uh, <laughs> my name is pronounced Mari, although a lot of English people think it's Marie. And I always say that my interest in challenging behavior started very young when I went to school and all the teachers got my name wrong and I had to correct them. But as my sister said, well, you could have kept your mouth shut and been called Marie for the rest of your school life. It didn't even occur to me to do that. <laughs> so, you know, I have a bit of a personal interest in what we think of is a challenging child or a challenging behavior in a child because often, it tells us quite a lot about the child's personality or perhaps the need they have about learning. Is that... Hello? Okay, great. <laughs> Sorry, I'm going to roam around now because uh, once a teacher, always a teacher, I think. I have to keep control of all this room, you see. <laughs> Notice any bad behaviour and make sure it stops. <laughs> okay, my um, background is I taught English for many years in different countries um, and I was always very interested in the psychology of what helps people to learn, what makes good learners, or for a lot of adult learners as well, what makes it difficult for them to learn, what, you know, what the blocks are to learning. And I'm sure some of you have that issue every day in your teaching. Um, and then I came back to the UK, because I'd been training quite a lot of teachers from um, abroad. And I thought, really, I should be doing something in my own education system. Um, and by a strange way, I ended up working a lot with young people who were at risk of exclusion from school because of their behavior. I ran a unit in a secondary school um, in England, which <laughs> I used to tell the kids it was very much like a railway station. You know, it was the last stop. You could either get on the train and leave, or you could do what I wanted them to do and get involved in learning and behave. Um, and with that group of kids, who, interestingly enough, although they're in secondary, a lot of them had not been noticed in primary. Because what happened very often in primary was they got sent to the head, the principal, and sat outside his or her office drawing nicely for the afternoon. And no one really noticed that they weren't learning anything and that they couldn't sit in a class and behave. And of course, when they came to secondary, and more was expected of them, and teachers didn't have the same sort of 
shall we say, patience in some ways with their behaviour, no one knew what to do with them. So they had a great idea that they'd open a unit in the school and they'd employ somebody who would come along with magic dust, sprinkle it on them, like the silos that David was talking about, and bring them back reformed. And that idiot was me. <laughs> because I later found out that anybody in the area that, that knew about the job said they wouldn't touch it with a barge pole because it was hopeless. And I can tell you now, if you're struggling with some of your classes, I went home every day for a few weeks and cried in frustration and hopelessness about what to do. And I think it's only my own stubbornness and pig-headedness that made me continue. And I came across something called educational therapy. And educational therapy is, some, is a way of working with a child that looks at blocks to learning that might be emotional, that might have be laid down brain patterns from earlier years that are getting in the way of their learning and their behavior in school. And that became very useful to me in understanding some of the behavior. So what I'm going to share with you today, this, in this hour, are some of the ideas that I've learned through my own experience, bitter experience, I will say, um, but also some of the ideas from educational therapy that I thought, actually, teachers should know this. Because if we knew this, it would help us understand how to deal with some of the more challenging teach children or how to deal with children that we, we want to include more. Um, and the link with inclusiveness and special needs is that many of the children that I worked with actually had undiagnosed learning difficulties that were not noticed because the only thing we talked about was their behaviour. And it's an interesting phenomenon, and I'm, I'd say it's pretty... The same in a lot of countries. Boys in particular, I hate to tell you men, but boys in particular would rather be thought of badly behaved than to have a special need or a learning difficulty. <laughs> schools in England, special schools in England for behavioural difficulties are full of boys that have hearing problems. Because actually, very young on, it often happens, they can't hear what's happening in the class, they feel stupid, they don't want to admit it, they start being silly or showing off or whatever, and every single discussion that ever happens around them after that is about their behaviour. So behaviour and learning are not two separate strands. For many years in the UK, there was this idea that you either manage behaviour or you talked about learning. But actually, a child's behaviour will usually tell you something about what's the problem with their learning. You know, um, if I can't do it, if I don't understand, if I can't hear properly, if I can't see properly, um, if I can't read it because it's, you know, I'm dyslexic and it's all jumbled up, the chances are the first indication you have is the way I behave. Now, if I'm a, you know, well, a nice, polite child, I might politely show you. <laughs> if I'm a child like I was, <laughs> at school, I might show you in a lot more loud, obnoxious ways. So when we think about challenging behavior, I wanted us just to, I'm not gonna cover all of this today, but just some thoughts. <clears throat> behavior is one of the, um, I think it's the poor relation of special educational needs. Because I think if we're honest, most of us have more sympathy for someone, for example, who has a visual impairment or a physical impairment or has a problem with reading and writing, or with communication. We can understand that. The child that seems to behave badly and not do what they're told, and we, don't, we can't control them and we can't make them learn, a lot of us think, well, that's their problem, they should just stop. You know, they're just being naughty, or their parents haven't brought them up properly, and they should just get over it. But we need to think about it as a special educational need. Because if it's happening all the time, and it's happening across subjects, and it's happening in different environments, the child is telling you something. They're telling you something about their need. But it is a challenge to yourself to ask yourself, do you really think you should have to teach these children? Because traditionally in many countries, and I live in Ireland now, which was very traditional, the teacher 
spoke and the kids did what they were told. And the teacher had respect because that was the culture and tradition. What we have now across the world in different ways is children with different expectations, families with different expectations and social norms, and maybe we are feeling more challenged as teachers. And, and when we feel challenged, sometimes we don't respond in the best way. So our own awareness is quite important. We need to think about, do we want to manage a child's behavior, or, or are we actually trying to help them change it? Now, behavior management is all those things around classroom management and routines and structures and instructions and differentiation and all that sort of stuff that helps. But if you have children who are behaving in a way that is not socially acceptable and is going to get them in lots of trouble, you probably want to help them change. Now, the bad news is you can't make them change. I hate to tell that to a group of educationalists, but you can't make anybody do anything. And believe me, I try and make my husband do a lot of things. <laughs> and I often get that phrase thrown back at me. Well, I thought you told teachers that you can't make anyone do anything. Um, what you can do is change your reaction to things. The only person you have control over is yourself. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that. Because essentially, if you change your reaction to stuff, the chances are the kids will change. And the other thing about change is think about if you make New Year's resolutions. I don't know about in your country, but in the UK, every New Year, we're all going to lose weight, stop smoking, go to the gym, be more organised. And by about the 6th of January, we've decided we're not that sort of person. Or we've eaten one cake, so we decide to eat 25 of them, yeah? Because change is difficult. Change takes time. Change involves getting it wrong and trying again. So if you are trying to help children change, be aware it's, a, it's, a, it's a, not a linear process. That it, you know, it involves making mistakes, working on it again, trying again. It can be very frustrating. Developing policy, um, Dave was talking a bit about policy. If you have a policy around how you deal with behavior and children with behavioral issues, it should not be separated from your teaching and learning policy. Because the reason we have jobs is because children are meant to learn. We don't have jobs to make children behave and manage themselves, most of us. But often it feels like that if you're a teacher. We need to make sure the link with learning is explicit. We need to see it as a communication. We need to think about if a child's misbehaving, as Dave was saying, curriculum, differentiation. Am I teaching in the right way? Am I teaching as the way this child learns? There's a lot of things linked into what, what we talk about behavior. And obviously, at the end, I'll talk a little bit about some strategies and maybe the way forward. Yeah? So... <clears throat> I'd like you maybe to just to look at this saying. It, it kind of um, underpins a lot of the way I work. Pupil behavior is very sensitive. Be why? Because it makes us feel incompetent. When we have a child in our class, or a few, and we don't know what to do about it, and we like to help, and we like to have, know, teachers, are, we're all very good at wanting to know what to do, we feel quite incompetent in front of that child very often. When we feel incompetent, our emotions sometimes take over. Parents feel very challenged. You know, when you work with children with challenging behavior, you often feel like you're working with challenging parents because, you know, they come in. Where I used to work in Essex, one of the classic things I used to get if you rang up a parent about their child's behavior was, I don't ring you up at work and ask you how to do my job. So why are you ringing me up at work, asking me how to do your job? <laughs> it's quite a potential conflict there, isn't there, in, in that beginning of a dialogue. But what helps a lot is to think most parents, when it's around behavior, and actually I suppose around special needs often in general, they feel quite hope, helpless and incompetent as well. They don't know what to do. When they feel angry or upset or helpless, it's probably gonna come, so they end up shouting at you. You end up getting fed with the parents, the child's shouting at everybody, and actually our emotions have taken over because we don't know what to do. When I trained as a 
educational therapist, one of the key elements of psychotherapy is to be curious, to be in a curious state when you look at you know, a family or a child or someone you're trying to help. One of the key things about education in schools is we should know what to do. There's a, there's a difference in attitude. If we're going to try and help children with special needs or with challenging behaviour, we need to try to be curious. We need to try and be aware of our emotions, but step back from it and think, what's, what's going on here? Why could this be happening? What's it telling me? But it's very hard when you're feeling personally upset to not to be able to step back and be able to do that, you know? Well, to give you an example, if I was a, te a therapist running a, if I was a teacher running a small group of kids with behavior problems, and they were running around the room on the tables, throwing themselves out the window, which they've been known to try and do. <coughs> uh, as, a, as a therapist, I, as a teacher, I think, oh my God, what am I going to do? Sit down, sit down, I've got to control you. Get somebody in to help me, get him, you know. I, I'd have to do something about it. If I was running a therapy group, and the same children were running around madly, you know, pretending to throw themselves out the window, a therapist would think, hmm, that's interesting. <laughs> I wonder what that's communicating to me about their need. I always say I spent thousands of pounds trained to be an educational therapist to learn two phrases. That's interesting. And I wonder. <laughs> but in all seriousness, it's quite a shift in attitude because in education, we have to know. School is full of people that need to know what to do. Education departments are full of people that are having to make decisions and know what to do. With these kind of problems, what we need to do is step back and wonder. If possible, wonder with the child, wonder with the parents, be curious. It sounds very simple. The reason it took thousands of pounds to learn is it's like a different microchip in some, most of our brains in the institutions we work in. So, okay. and the other, um, quotation that I, that I like a lot is this one, that a child's current behavior often reflects a sane response to their life circumstances. Now, if you think about that, you probably have children in your, some of your schools that by the time they get to school, they've done probably a day's work by even getting themselves in. There could be all sorts of things going on at home. There could be all sorts of preoccupations. You know, they get in, and they've done the bit by actually getting into school. Um, children, for example, who've lived in quite violent environments or where responses of parents or people around them are unpredictable will have learned certain responses to keep them safe. So they may well have learned never, for example to ask a question because you might get hit or ridiculed or shouted at. So when they come into school and we say, we want you to ask questions and be curious, we're asking them to have a behavior that's not safe. So some behaviors from some children are things they've learned to be safe. And I learned this, I used to work in Hackney in East London on a project with kids that were at risk of being out of school and most of them were in gangs and you know, quite troublesome, untroubled. And one of the boys I was working with was tall. He, 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 he was very imposing. He was definitely going to be a gang leader, there was no doubt about it, on the streets. He got in a lot of trouble at school. And what I used to watch him and his friends doing, they used to practice walking down the street. You know, this kind of thing. It's not like that. <laughs> Bowling along, they used to call it. Because if you walk like that, on the streets of East London, people leave you alone. You're probably quite safe. If you walk like that into your classroom at school and you're 14 and you're big, what do you think the teacher thinks? Yeah, the teacher thinks you're trying to intimidate, you're trying to take over, um, you know, you're trying to give me some sort of big message about, you know, who you are. This is what was said about him all the time. And uh, 
what it started with was the way he walked around. So what we worked on, me and him, was not rocket science. It was how to walk into a classroom differently, how to sit down differently, and see what effect that has. And it took a long time for him to accept that that's what he needed to do in order to learn. Because he said, the teachers should realize this, Mari. He said, they say I'm trying to intimidate, and I'm not. So I said to him, what does intimidate mean? What would it look like? He said, oh, I know how to intimidate people. I do it all the time outside. Intimidation is when I set out to intimidate you, when my purpose is to make you scared. I don't do that at school, he said. I just walk in expecting an education, and they're not giving it to me. You can imagine the teachers loved him. But, but he had a point. Really, which is why I talk to teachers a lot now, is I would have liked to work with the teachers in that school about not to interpret his way of walking in and the way he did that to mean something it didn't. Because actually, it was a behavior that was absolutely essential to keeping him safe outside school. And if we were going to take that away from him, we needed to give him something better. Yeah? So one little phrase that I actually learned many years ago from a colleague in Ireland is one thing I might often say with kids in that situation now is, you don't need to be like that in here. Yeah? Because you don't need to be like that in here allows you to keep your safe behavior outside. So sometimes, and I think a lot of you are language teachers, the actual language you use very precisely can help make a shift with some of these young people. But we have to be prepared to accept that this part, this phrase is true. Another girl I worked with at the same time in Hackney, she was always angry, always, always in trouble. I was always having to go in and talk to her about her science lesson and about her English lesson and how just because that girl looked at her wrongly, she didn't need to beat her up. You know, it was all a bit extreme. And I said, you know, we're going to do, ang we need to do some anger management. She said, anger management, Mari. This girl had, was in foster care, and she'd had, she, took, she had about 13 placements in about two years. She said to me, if you had my life, Mari, you'd be bloody angry. She said, if I wasn't angry, I'd be dead. I'd have killed myself long ago. So her, and she taught me a very important lesson, because her anger was really important. That's why she had got to the age of 15 in these circumstances, fighting the world, but it kept her alive. What she needed to learn is that when the science teacher asked you to sit down, you didn't need that anger, and you didn't need to get into a big fight with them. In that situation, you didn't need that anger. So, you know, anger's an interesting thing. Anger often masks a lot of other feelings. It's a very secondary emotion. Mostly when we're angry, we're disappointed, we feel let down, we're hurt, we feel stupid, we feel rejected. I never ever run groups now called anger management. I know they're popular around the place. Because I work with so many children who have a legitimate right to be anger, angry, and who am I to tell them that we're going to do an exercise where you count to ten, or you write your feelings on a bit of paper and you throw them in the bin. They might work for sort of medium-term things, but what those children need is they need to learn that emotions are okay and how we deal with emotions is what we all have to work with. Yeah? We all have to learn how to work with our emotions. We all have to know, you know how to behave and, or what to do with it. But it's not about anger. It's about acknowledging all those other emotions that we're having and they're okay. So what I'm going to ask you to do, thinking about emotions, is think about your emotions and your feelings. <clears throat> I did this exercise recently with a group of teachers that work in a special school in England. And one of the men said he didn't have any feelings during the day. <laughs> so I said, well, well you're dead. So <laughs> and he said, and he kind of, no. I said, well, you know, if you're alive and a human being, you had feelings. He said, I can't allow myself to have them because I wouldn't be able to do my job. That's a very interesting comment about what was happening for him in his environment and perhaps what support he needed to do his job better. 
So I'm going to ask you now, and I know not all of you work in schools, but I think you're all involved in education. With the person next to you, I'm going to ask you to do an activity, and I'm going to try and stop it by putting my hand up like this. You probably know this activity. When, I, when you see my hand up like this, could you put your hand up and stop talking? Okay, we'll try it. Um, what I want you to do with the person next to you is I want you to think back to your last day at school, your last working day, when you were in school and teaching. And if you don't, if you work with schools, maybe when you were in schools, or if you're in the office, your last day at work, right? And I want you to tell your partner all the feelings you remember having from the time you got up, jumped out of bed full of the joys of spring, couldn't wait to get to work, <laughs> or crawled out of bed, counting the days to the next holiday, <laughs> all the way through your day, everything that happened, what feelings you had, and all the way after school as well, because we're human beings and we have things that go on after school. So to the moment you got to, went to bed, having drank two bottles of wine, <laughs> kicked your cat and argued with your husband, or whatever it is you do, that helps you. Yeah? So could you, with your partner, just take a couple of minutes and, eat, and just tell each other now, when you think about that day, from the beginning to the end, all the feelings you remember having. Okay? Couple of minutes. Okay. You're a very obedient group. <laughs> Actually, that thing, one of the things that I talk about strategies, particularly this afternoon, non-verbal strategies for children that are having problems in school are much better if you can get a routine than always, you know, if I was shouting over you, be quiet, be quiet, I'm doing what I don't want you to do. Yeah? We do that quite a lot. We're saying, be quiet, be quiet, be quiet, but we're actually shouting. Yeah? Or we walk up and down, like, saying, yeah, calm down, calm down, calm down, be quiet, be quiet, be quiet, and we're running around like a mad thing, yeah? So non-verbal things and how you use your space and your body could be important. Okay, your feelings. What did you notice? Anybody like to just shout out what you noticed? About when you were talking, like, when thinking about the talk you just had about your feelings, what do you notice about the, the feelings that you just... Okay, thanks. So during the one day, this lady said during the one day or even part of a day, probably didn't even time to finish it, all sorts of feelings. Yeah, most people agree, yeah? Anyone else, what you kind of noticed about each other's feelings? They're yeah, quite opposite. Okay, some, some of you had quite opposite feelings. Okay, did any, anybody else notice that maybe you had quite similar feelings, even if you work in different... Con uh, this lady here. Stress, a lot of str stress, stress. <laughs> Before you even wake up, you're, you're... Okay, yeah, so... Yeah, so they actually... Waking up and then the thought and the preparation... It's interesting, anxiety. I work with quite a lot of anxious children. You know, um, young people that have problems in school are actually quite anxious most of the time. And a lot of anxiety is about what might happen or what you need to do or what's it, what you've got to do. It's one of the things that's working quite a lot at the moment in UK schools is something called mindfulness. The idea of staying in the moment and just noticing in the moment what's happening and not always be thinking ahead what you need to do. So it's interesting that some anxiety comes from that. 
Anybody else? Anything you noticed? Did you, for example, notice that there was quite a roller coaster of emotions? Yeah. And maybe you notice that certain days, made me think about them, there's actually quite a lot of negative, or the things you remember, or the things you, you got, had troubles with or you couldn't do, they kind of stick in your mind. Um, I've done this with like hundreds of teachers now across the world, and one of the things I would say is, most people notice a massive amount of emotions, massive roller coasters, that within a, a second can go from here to here, or here to here, um, a lot, quite a lot of stress and anxiety, quite a lot of, um, you know, trying to be on top of everything and worrying about all the things that are to do and, and worrying about what you haven't done and what you got wrong or the kid you couldn't reach or the class didn't go very well. So why do you think teachers across the world have this roller coaster of emotions and feelings when they just think about a day or part of a day? Okay, so some of it is because you're thinking about, well, you know what's going to happen from past experience, yeah? And, and what I would say is essentially because you manage relationships all day. It's one of those professions where it's quite hard to hide from people because every day you manage relationships with the kids, with your colleagues, with your managers, with the parents, yeah? Um, you know, I used to work... My first job when I left university was management training in the bank, <laughs> it was a big disaster for me and that West Bank. I don't bank with them anymore, anyway. Um, <laughs> that'll make a big difference to their profits. But um, if you had a bad night, or you went out and drank a bit too much, or you hadn't had a good day, you could manage your day and your diary, shuffle a few papers around your desk and change a few appointments around, and kind of hide. You can't do that in schools. And you can't do it because the kid that has the special need or the behaviour issue will get you. They will get you. They will notice on some instinctive level that you're having a bad day or you're hungover <laughs> <laughs> or you had a row with someone. You know, I work with kids who used to say to teachers, obviously shouldn't have, I mean, <laughs> oh, well, I said to her, I said, Miss, it's not my problem if you're not getting on with your husband. <laughs> you're here to teach us. I can't do anything about that. So they'd get sent to me for being rude. Obviously, it wasn't appropriate to say it, but they probably were right. That teacher was probably... Because the other thing we do as teachers is we suppress our emotions. We ignore them. In other professions where you deal with challenging situations, like social workers, counsellors, therapists, you have something called supervision, where you can go and offload you know, your stuff and, and what's going on. And... <laughs> One of the things that we've been trying to do around mental health of teachers in the UK is how to build in that kind of supervision in schools. Because most of us nowadays are working with very complex, vulnerable, challenging children. And, and, and the standard thing in schools is keep going, keep going. In something called transaction analysis, it's a form of therapy that has, they talk about drivers, things that, that move us forward. And I think there's three that are very prevalent in schools all across the world. One is be perfect. One is be strong. And one is try harder. <laughs> now, good teachers, on a good day, that helps them do a good job. When you go into overdrive with those, you end up stressed. Be perfect is kind of silly to say to be perfect to ourselves, because what do we say to the kids we're teaching? make mistakes, you learn from your mistakes. No one's perfect. And yet, when we get stressed out, it's probably because the lesson didn't go perfectly, or something happened in the class I didn't expect, or I should have planned for that, I didn't know what to say. Try harder is fine, but education is full of examples of where we find something that doesn't work, and we do more of it, right? So we try harder. We try harder in the same way. I'll give you an example in the UK. If a child is in trouble at school in, in England, they, what they do is you have a meeting, and you call in the parent, and you try and talk to the child, and you set some targets. And they get a report card, and all the teachers have to tick how they're doing. Which, you know, for some kids, actually works quite well just to be noticed in that way. But for certain kids that have more complex issues, 
what generally happens is after about two or three days of perfection, this child has turned into an angel, which they can't keep up because none of us can. Something goes wrong in their first lesson. Because they're the kind of kid that thinks as soon as I make a mistake, it's a disaster, they go for broke. It's a bit like, you know, that phrase, I must be hung for a sheep as a lamb. So if I'm already in trouble in lesson one, I might as well make a big, big fuss in lesson two and break time so the whole school knows I'm in trouble. So then we have another meeting. We send them home for a few days. We have another meeting. And we call in someone else, maybe a psychologist. And we set a plan and we set targets and we have a plan. And off they go, a few more days, somebody else helping them, meeting you in the morning or something. Same thing happens. We send them home for a few more days. We invite a few more people in. By then, you've got about eight adults, one child, who will agree to anything to get out of the room. So what we're doing, quite blatantly, is we have found something that doesn't work, and every time it goes wrong, we try harder doing the same thing. What we need to do is try differently. You know, is that saying if what you're doing isn't working, do something different? Because the worst you'll get is what you've got already. I was called into a school recently in Ireland, and I was going to do some training about behaviour. My heart always sinks when they ask me to do that. Because what that means is bring some magic dust. Don't ask us to change. Um, and uh, the head, who was very keen, she'd read my book and she was very keen, she said, oh, I want you to meet the head of the fifth year. So the fifth year in Ireland would be the year before they leave school. So they're about 16. Because she's having a terrible time with all of them. And I know she's going to want to talk to you or she's going to have questions if you're training. So maybe if you met her before, she could tell you some of the issues and you could address them in the training. Okay, fair enough. So in comes this, this woman came in. She said, oh my God, oh, it's absolutely terrible. This is the worst year we've ever had in our life. Oh, every single kid in this year is terrible. All of them. We've never had a year like it. Yeah. I felt like leaving as soon as, you know. But anyway, so I said, okay, normally we feel quite emotional about things. But there's usually kind of ringleaders. It's not everybody. There's kind of a group. So can we narrow it down? No, it's all of them. <laughs> Eventually, she decided it was one class. We went to him after about 10 minutes. It was 15 boys, all in the same class. So I said, OK, normally if you have a group like that, there'll be a couple of ringleaders, there'll be a couple of hangers-on, there'll be a couple of people that go either way, and there's a few that you could maybe they just keep quiet and you might be able to sway. So maybe we could break it down like that. No, all of them are absolutely terrible. And she said, when I go into class, they do nothing. Or if I try things, they throw things at me. They, they're rude to me. If I turn around and write on the board, they're throwing things at me. So I said, OK, what have you tried? What I do, she said, is I go home every night, and I think about their interests, and I think about what you know, they'd like, and I look up things on the internet, and I plan, I plan, I plan, and I do these worksheets, and I bring them in, and they rubbish them, and they throw them away, and they won't do the work. So I said, what do you do then? So I go home, and I look up things, and I think, what would these boys like? What are they interested in? I write really good worksheets. And, you know. <laughs> and I said, so after we went through this about three or four times, I said, um, have you tried asking them? She said, what? I said, have you tried asking them what they think the problem is? She said, no, I couldn't do that. I said, what would happen if you did that? Well, They'd throw things at me, they'd be rude, they'd shout at me. I said, well, they're doing that already. So if you tried something drastic, like asking them what their interests are and what they'd like to do, the worst you'll get is what you've got already. The best you might get is something that might work. <clears throat> and then she said, oh, I can't do that, I can't do that, that wouldn't work, that wouldn't work. Anyway, I've got to go now, because my mother is in hospital dying, and I go out every lunchtime to see her, but it doesn't, it, that doesn't get in the way of my work. <laughs> now, this, the level of this woman's stress was massive. At the end of half an hour with her, I wanted to punch her. <laughs> Says a lot about me and my reaction to stress. <laughs> but I was really thinking, if I was a 15-year-old boy in your class, I'd have lost it long ago, actually, with this amount of stress in the room, this amount of anxiety projected into me. What she needed was someone to sit down with her and say, there's this massive thing going on in your life. There's all these feelings you have. Take some time and deal with it. You don't need to be perfect. You don't need to be strong all the time. And you don't need to keep going in this way. 
So the issue wasn't these young people. They, I would say young people and children come into school every day and they more or less do the same thing. Sometimes better, sometimes worse. What makes the biggest difference to them is the reactions of the adults around them. So what we need in schools before we do anything about strategies and policies, about inclusion and you know, t tips to help your class, we need to accept that teachers' feelings and emotional state and physical state are as important as the curriculum and as important as how we teach. Because if you can't manage yourself, you're not going to be managed, able to manage complex, vulnerable, challenging children. <laughs> Thanks for that. And then, of course, you have to all change and do what I tell you, yeah? No. But, you know, it is really important. So, what I... We... Okay. So, how do we manage them? What works for you? I, I'm just going to briefly run through a few tips. Um, you know, you probably all have your own ways of managing stress. I, these are some tips that help me. Because I would say that when I ran that unit in the school, my issue wasn't the children. My arguments were with the other staff most of the time because of this idea that I've got to fix them. And whereas I was going back and saying, what can we do together? How can you respond? What do you do that works? Can we do more of that? So one of the things that, ha that helped me a lot is that tip there. Focus on what's under your control. If you made a list of all the things that bothered you in one of your bad days and you divided it into two, things that at the moment are in my control and things that at the moment are not in my control. You would probably find that you obsess quite a lot about the things that are not in your control. You know, at this moment. And what really the tip is, focus on those things that in the moment are in your control and you can do something about. And try to let go of some of the stuff that actually in the moment there is nothing you can do about. So... You can't change a child's life circumstances. I think it's very hard when you're working with some children because their stories are quite sad. And sometimes our reaction to that is to get very frustrated and angry at the world. But what you might be able to do with that child is provide an example of an adult who can listen to them, an adult who takes them seriously, an adult who acknowledges that it's, life is crap sometimes. You know, I was at a conference recently and... Um, on the wall, it was said that everything is better, life is better if you have a, is always better if you have a positive attitude. <laughs> and I thought, hmm, but it's not, is it? Some of the children I work with, their life is shit, to be honest. And me coming along and saying, think positively, don't worry, be happy, is actually insulting. What they need is someone to say, that must be very hard. Yeah, I can, I can understand that must be really hard sometimes. And it must really feel like, what's the point? Or, you know, sometimes I guess you do feel helpless or hopeless or think school's a waste of time. It's like that acknowledgement. One of the things from, I learned from therapy is acknowledging something has a powerful effect. Again, as teachers, we always say, well, then what do I do? But acknowledging it and showing it and being there for them, being, not doing, can be very powerful for children who've got very difficult lives. So don't underestimate the power you have. So focusing what's on your control is quite important. Um, the school I used to work in that I was describing, I had a head teacher, Tony, who one of my colleagues used to say, Mari, whenever you go down the corridor and you say to Tony, can I, Tony, can I have a word? He looks really scared and runs into his office. <laughs> and I thought, mm, because normally... Tony can have a word meant me going into his office and telling him everything he needed to change about his school and his teachers so that these kids could learn better. Now, <laughs> what I realised was I couldn't make him do what I wanted. Believe me, it was a sad re realisation. <laughs> and uh, it nearly broke me. <laughs> but I realised I could change the way I communicated with him. I could change the time. Like, in fairness to him, grabbing him in the corridor when he's probably doing something else and demanding his attention was not going to start it off very well. I also noticed that whenever I said, I feel frustrated or I feel it's not going very well, he disagreed with me. He didn't talk feelings. 
So then he'd say, you know, no, that's not true. And I'd say, you can't tell me how I feel, Tony. And the conversation would generally just get worse and worse. So I thought I could think about how I spoke to him, using language that he could actually, you know, not put all his feeling stuff in, but be more evidence-based, more objective, maybe things that he could relate to. And we might get further. But the only thing I could control was how I did all that. And it was actually, it was a big relief, I think, well, to him anyway, <laughs> But sorry to me. So the other one, be your own best friend or your own coach. You know when you're having one of those days and you're beating yourself up? If your friend came to you in school and they said, I don't know, I can't cope anymore. Kids have changed, teaching has changed, people expect more of us. I'm no good at this. I, you know, I can't do it. I've tried. I'm, I'm getting worse. I'm tired. I, can't, you know, I probably should just leave. I don't think you'd say, you're right. You're rubbish. You're old-fashioned. You've been around too long. Give up. Well, <laughs> um, But we say that to ourselves on a bad day. We, we have all this negative self-talk on a bad day. So be your own best friend. Is talk to yourself as you would to your best friend in those moments. And the interesting thing about this is if you learn to manage yourself, you can share the strategies with the children. Because a lot of children that get in trouble with their behavior don't have any ways of managing it. They think it just happens to them. Do you know, I often used to say, I've got a bad temper, my dad's got a bad temper, we've all got a bad temper. Right, that's quite fixed, isn't it? You can't do much about that. But if you start to think, well, you know, what would help you when you're feeling stressed? This is what I do, I say this to myself. Or this is what I do. You're helping them learn that this is something they can have control over. It doesn't have to have control over them. Even kids that have been given a label like ADHD, which I'll talk about in this afternoon. What I'd often say to kids with ADHD is, what percentage of your brain are you still in control of? Even if you're on Ritalin or medication. Because that's the percentage of your brain we're going to work with, and we're going to think of ways to help you focus, concentrate, and calm down. We, children need to have that kind of control put back into them and understand they can do it. But we can't do it unless we've thought about it for ourselves. Um, Focus on six highlights, a very simple exercise at the end of every day. Write down the six highlights. It's actually quite hard, because after two, most teachers give up. Because we're trained, we go home thinking about the child that we didn't reach, the class that didn't work, the colleague that upset us. When you begin to notice the highlights, you begin to be able to, to notice it with the kids. Six is deliberately too many, because we're trying to retrain our brain. So I'd ask you to do that. Go home for a couple of weeks. At the end of each day, before you go leave school, write down six highlights. See what happens in your brain. It's important in terms of managing behavior of children because if I, children that get in trouble at school only get noticed when they're in trouble everywhere in the world. I've worked in schools where I think if I was a kid, I'd either have to be the best academically or the worst behaved because everyone knows them. And then there's a huge chunk of children in the middle that we're not quite sure sometimes even what their names are. So if I'm getting in trouble for my behavior for whatever reasons, I need the teacher to notice when I'm not doing it. So if you have little Johnny who comes into your class late, won't take off his hat, he's always going miss, 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 chatting, whatever, and you have a day when he doesn't do that, you probably don't notice it because you're on to the next thing. But if you notice it as a highlight, you think, actually, that lesson went really well. Do you know what? He, he actually was following the rules today. If you notice it for yourself, you can say it to him. You can say, thanks, great lesson. Well done for focusing on your own work. Thanks for waiting with your hand up. Well done for not turning around and chatting when they were being silly. You need to start noticing it for yourself to notice for them so that they get noticed when they're doing the right thing. Because otherwise, they're going to go back to doing the wrong thing. Um, create ways to offload safely. You know, people often say to me, well, the way I deal with stress, I talk to my colleagues. Or I have a trusted colleague that I, you know, vet how I'm feeling. That's great. But I would always say, make sure you've agreed what the, what you want, how you want to do it. You know, do you want to just vent your feelings and then they just listen? Because if you want to do that and then they say, well, what I would do is, 
you might want to kill them. Yeah? Because you just want to get it off your chest. And the other thing is, every class, every staff room in every school I've ever been into has what I call the toxic corner. The group of people who come in at break time starts off, oh my God, that little Johnny in year eight, you know, I thought the head said he wasn't going to be in. I had him in my class. He ruined everything. We shouldn't have to teach him. You know, there's not enough discipline in this school and the management doesn't help us. And, you know, and no one appreciates us and all the parents are against us and our pensions are being cut and our hours are getting, you know, whatever. And who'd be a teacher nowadays? And we used to have respect and children have right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> You've heard it. So what I would say is in that little corner of people, at the end of it, does anyone feel like going out and teaching little Johnny in year eight? <laughs> Generally not. <laughs> So if you find yourself offloading, ask yourself the question at the end, was this energizing? Do I now feel better about going out and teaching? Or was this draining? And I now feel like giving up. And some people, let's face it, are energizers. And some people, and I mean adults, are drainers. Avoid them. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know. and the other thing I'd say is learn to say no. I know if we've got a lot of ladies in the audience, as we often do, and I have to say, women, generally, very bad at saying no to things, wanting to help the world, do everything, getting stressed out then because too much to do, yeah? Um, um, so learn to say no realistically as well about things. And setting an anchor is something from something called neuro-linguistic programming. Some of you may have heard of it. Anchor is the idea of when I think about something, it cheers me up or puts me in a better mood. And it's one of those things that in the moment in class you might be able to do. So for example, my nephew when he was younger couldn't say the word hippopotamus. He used to say something like mippomotamus. And my sister, his mother, used to think it was funny to get him to say it. Probably scar the child for life. But very soon, which is what I like about my nephew, he thought I'm not gonna be made a fool of by my mother so he'd only say hippo. And, you, and, my mom, and his mum would go, what's the longer word, darling? And he'd go, hippo, mum, hippo. That's why he manages to deal with my sister better than the rest of us. Um, but that's the positive anchor for me. It's the sound of his voice. If I thought about Aidan and that, that would cheer me up almost instantly. Another colleague of mine had a, a visual anchor. He had a picture on his desk of his wedding on a beach, but it was turned upside down. I don't think his wife knew, actually. She wouldn't be pleased. But what he said was, obviously, that's a happy memory. So if he's in class and he's stuck with a child and he's having a problem, it's not working, he doesn't know what to do. If he looks at that picture, happy memory, but turned upside down to remind him, in this situation, he needs to do something different. He needs to stop what he's doing and just do anything, but that's just slap himself out into something different. And the upside down was the anchor. So we can set them for ourselves... We can work with children on them. You probably have your own. You probably have things like sounds or music or pictures or memories that if you actually chose to set them, would help you. So, I'm aware of time. Started about five past, didn't we? Yeah, okay. Um, yeah, so you can do it with children. One of the boys I used to work with, one of these classic, used to say, I can't help it. When I get angry, miss, I just get angry and I just, that's it, and I just start fighting. So, an interesting question for kids that say that is, what happens just before you get angry. What happens in yourself? What do you notice just before? Because normally we talk to them about what to do when you're angry. But what they need to learn is recognize the signs of when it's starting. And he said, oh, I hear a voice. Because I often say, is it a voice? Is it a feeling? Is it a thought? Whatever. What, tell me about the voice. It's my dad saying, don't stand for that. Get them. Okay, so is there another voice that would be different? Because we found something that's the start of it, the trigger. Well, my nan, my nan would say, you're better than that, don't do it. So I said, how do you think you could, in the moment you're getting, start to get angry, how could you change the voices? I couldn't, my dad takes over. Okay, tell me something about your nan. He said, her wallpaper, she's got big flowery wallpaper, you know, that dark flowery wallpaper, you know me, she probably got it as well. Because obviously I'm 160 as well. <laughs> okay, we won't go with that. I said, okay, what about if you thought about the wallpaper 
would that help you think about your nan's voice? He thought it might. So what I'd say to them is practice it in a safe thing. When you're feeling a bit irritated or a bit annoyed, practice this anchor. You begin to feel angry. Can you see your nan's wallpaper? Can you see her voice? And it worked brilliantly for him. It's kind of like a magic trick to them because it's helping them manage their internal stuff. He was the only child in school. I don't know if this happens here. That, you know, one of the biggest insults in the UK is your mum or your nan. Because they don't even say the whole sentence that's an insult about your mum or your nan. They just say, your mum. So he was the only child in our school that he went up to him and said, your nan. <laughs> it actually calmed him down rather than made him fight. But that was his anchor, okay? So we learnt it. We could teach it to him. Okay, so... Not here we won't be able to do. Let's just... Okay, yeah. I just want to say something about what happens between us and children that we're having a problem with. Here's a, here's a, a self-portrait by a boy who's 11. He was asked by the people that were working with him to draw a picture of himself. This is what he drew. What I'm going to ask you to do just for a couple of seconds is with the person you're next to, what's your reaction to it, your gut feeling? When you look at that picture, that's what he drew of himself as his self-portrait. Can you just take a couple of minutes? Again, I'll put my hand up. What's your gut, your gut reaction, your feelings? Just quickly, the person next to you. Okay. All right. Um, anyone like to throw out any words? Angry, sad, scared, scared, yeah, violent. How does it make you feel? Does it make you feel violent? Or does it make you feel a bit worried or upset or frightened? Sad, yeah? A lot of powerful feelings. The reason I'm telling you this, one thing that happens quite a lot between us and children that are having problems is the feeling we're having might not be ours. It might be something called a projection from them. So it's not only about managing our feelings, it's about thinking about where they come from. Because often, if children can't manage a feeling, and they haven't had an example of an adult who can, they sort of give it to you, not consciously, but unconsciously. Yeah? So sometimes, those feelings you're having about sad, scared, upset, frightened, anger, they could have, they're probably a projection of how this boy was feeling. Powerful feelings that sometimes, this is where the English curriculum is very useful, can come out through metaphor. Much safer for that boy to talk about the picture, the boy in the picture, or the boy in the story, or the boy on the video. Much safer to talk about that than to talk about himself directly. Because many children that are in this position haven't got the words for it, even in their own language. Because they haven't often had examples of adults that can do that. So projection is something very useful to bear in mind. And I wish I'd known about it when I was working with those kids because on a Friday night, I used to go to the local supermarket, Tesco's. I used to wheel my trolley around and I used to think, I should give this job up. I'm getting nowhere. I'm hopeless, useless. Don't know what I'm doing. No one cares anyway. I'm sure stacking shelves in this supermarket would be better. I should work here. Or oh, some people nodding, you have that feeling. What I wish I'd known about was projection. I spent my days, as my staff did, with children who felt useless, not wanted, rubbish. Obviously, a lot of that was projected into us. If we had understood that concept, we could have thought about it for ourselves and helped us manage it. We might, if appropriate, might be able to name it. You know, if you're in a class, you might suddenly say, I'm feeling a bit stuck now or a bit hopeless. Is anyone else feeling like that? It's not becoming a therapist, it's just maybe naming something in the room that might be important to deal with in order for learning to take place. So I'm going to stop there. There's just a couple of things. There's 5,000 slides that we're not going to see, but there you go. Speed reading. Because <laughs> I wanted to show you this. Um, we're developing at the moment, as few people have said, a list of online resources. Um, my website and is up there as well. There's more about this. There's a couple of articles you might be interested in. I've got a couple of books here if people want to have a look at them. Um, and that's my publishing company. 
On the Teaching English website, there's a webinar about this called Dealing with Challenging Learners, where I go through a lot of it again. So if you wanted to log in and look at it, you might find it interesting. I wanted to finish with a story. When I moved to Ireland, I met a boy, amazingly, that was very similar to a boy that I'd worked with in England. Now, both of these boys, their fathers had died very young, when they were very young. Um, the boy in England, his father had died doing a, a robbery. He'd been shot doing a robbery when the boy was nine. The boy in Ireland, his father was a well-known drug dealer, and he'd been shot spectacularly by the police in a major thing in the middle of the city centre that was on the television and everything when the boy was seven. The boy in England, his mother, both the mothers couldn't cope after that. The boy in England, his mother became an alcoholic and spent most of her time in the pub. The boy in Ireland, his mother just sort of gave up, became very depressed on antidepressants, and there was lots of family issues around drugs. One of those boys, the boy in the UK, is now training to be an educational psychologist, and he's been very successful. The boy in Ireland has just been in the news recently because he's been um, indicted for murder, which he did do and he will get locked up for. The difference between the two boys, the one in England, the teachers worked with and kept him in school. The boy in Ireland, and tried to engage him in learning, tried to find out how to engage him. The boy in Ireland was put out of mainstream school very, very young into sort of alternative provisions and didn't really work. So I'll tell you that story because on the days you're having bad days with children that are challenging you, you need to remember that the job you do is really important. And teachers and keeping children in education, in inclusive classrooms, will actually change lives. And that's what you're doing. So on that note, I'll finish. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Mary. I'm glad you're such an awkward, obstinate, custard kind of person and that you persevered. Uh, you'll all have the chance to speak more to Mary, Mary later on, and uh, you'll have the chance to go to her workshops and get her name right, uh, which I just didn't. But for now, I'm going to hand over to my colleague, Christian Rajkovic, who will tell you what the arrangements are for the workshops. And for our online audience, he'll explain exactly how, what the implications are for them.